All right, guys, I think we are going to get started. So I'm Kasim Shepard. I teach uh, in the urban design program here at GSAP. Many of you know me. I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces, which is nice, as well as some new ones. Um, and I've been teaching at GSAP for uh, 10 years or so. Um, but I actually come from my original training and background is in documentary filmmaking. Uh, and I've been making films for even longer than I've been teaching at GSAP. Um, films and videos, uh, as well as writing about cities and urban change, um, and really telling stories about cities in a variety of media. So this topic is very near and dear to my heart, um, which is, uh, this is the fifth uh, annual Urban Design Storytelling Symposium, where every year we take a moment to reflect on um, the ways in which we've tried to incorporate and are constantly evolving uh, the notion of what storytelling in an applied sense means in the context of urban analysis and in the context of design and architecture pedagogy, in the context of planning and historic preservation. Um, and take this moment not only to reflect on what it means for us in a design school, but also try and take some cues from how other people in different fields and different sectors are thinking about um, storytelling in its applied sense and what it means to their practice. Um, in a wide variety of ways. So just a little bit of an overview of what it means in the context of our program. Um, in the summer, uh, the urban design students, many of whom are here, um, uh, have me for a class called uh, Reading New York Urbanisms, which tries to kind of mash up a, a really crash course in the history of New York City's urban development with some basic tools for how to tell stories about place. Um, and the purpose here is not necessarily to turn the urban design students into the makers of polished films, um, but rather to arm them with the tools of storytelling more generally, which includes uh, how to talk to strangers, how to conduct interviews, um, how to find ways and um, palettes and methodologies and tools for representing qualitative experience in places, right? Those things that you can't necessarily measure, those things that you can't necessarily calculate. Um, what, is the, what are some tools that we can use as designers, as subjective interpreters of place, um, to, to advance our understanding of those places, ideally in advance of any intervention that we might make as designers? Um, so in the past, we've looked at a variety of neighborhoods. Um, students have had their choice in groups of you know, three or two or three or four people to go out and make a portrait of a neighborhood. Um, and we've tried to sort of match this with different kinds of categories of neighborhoods or places, whether it was corridors or open spaces or uh, systems of infrastructure, uh, edge conditions and border conditions, and then, and then uh, try and introduce questions of urban systems into that analysis. How can you really tell a story about something that's abstract and distributed, uh, but embodied and manifested in the physical and material culture of space with a deep, deep belief um, on my part that I've kind of suffused into the pedagogy here that the social experience of place and the physical form of place are inextricable analytically. And that in order to um, uh, understand them and analyze them, we have to sort of take very seriously that interface and the fact that the physical and the social um, inform each other constantly. And in fact, that interpretations of place deeply, deeply inform our interventions. Um, so the ways in which cities have been represented and the ways in which neighborhoods and people and urban conditions have been represented uh, very much informs how we understand them and then how we design for them, not only understanding the challenges that we seek to redress, uh, but also the conditions that we might seek to enhance um, or the opportunities that we might seek to distribute more equitably. This past year, um, we, we focused on three districts in particular, um, Jersey City, Long Island City, and Sunset Park in greater integration with what the urban design students were doing in studio um, and came up with some really, really wonderful stories uh, that really spanned um, a whole range of different topics. Um, people interviewed designers, people interviewed activists and people on the street, uh, people talked to farmers and um, community advocates, uh, people talked to street vendors and workers, uh, really investigating everything that ranged from uh, an analysis of, of the various sounds of Sunset Park to um, understanding uh, specific design interventions in Long Island City, um, to looking at the history of public housing in Hoboken and Jersey City. I mean, a really wide range of stories uh, that really, I think, enhanced our understanding of the places that, that the students were then designing um, in a way to move from thinking about design as a process uh, where you're incorporating layers of information into a page format 
um, and moving towards a concept of uh, introducing methodologies with storyboarding and linearity and sequence um, and really trying to think about not only who we're talking to when we tell stories and whose stories we are telling, but how the process of sequencing and ordering those narratives uh, gives meaning and uh, in, in, uh, instantiates hierarchies in certain ways that are important to unpack before we can move forward. And crucially, the ever important relationship between context um, and details. Uh, so those are sort of some of the ways in which we think about what storytelling means to us um, as urban designers, but we always recognize that this, um, that we have a lot to learn from how the telling of stories, particularly stories about place um, and about people, uh, manifest uh, at the, in, in service of other fields, whether that's um, in the service of environmental um, preservation or, or ecological conservation, whether that's in the service of really thinking holistically about healthcare, or whether that's in the service of thinking holistically about community change. So um, I've invited a really uh, wonderful group of speakers to speak to those three ways of thinking about storytelling as an applied practice. And I've asked um, each of our wonderful presenters to reflect not only on the products of the stories um, that they've told uh, in their work um, as, as practitioners, of, as, as crafters of narrative, um, but also their process, which I think is very different, whether you're talking about a community-based arts project, whether you're talking about a novel, whether you're talking about a film or a book, um, you know, we're kind of, uh, well, the process uh, and tools of cinematography and filmmaking are very prevalent in the way that we think about this. The idea here is, again, not to um, advance one particular format of telling stories in moving images, but rather those tools that allow us to subjectively interpret place and spatial conditions and the people who reside in place and operate in place, um, and then use that to move forward to understand how those conditions might be ameliorated, improved, enhanced, et cetera. Um, so we have um, a, a, a filmmaker, a writer, an arts professional. Um, I'm gonna introduce all of them together and then ask each of them to come up and share a little bit of their process and work with you. And then I, they will join me at the table for a conversation about um, what narrative practice means to them and also how they see it changing, uh, whether it's through you know, their work in education um, or whether they see their work in communities or their work in sort of advocacy. Um, so we're going to start with John Bowermaster, who is a writer, filmmaker, and adventurer, and for six times has been granted uh, the National Geographic Expeditions Council grant. He's one of the society's ocean heroes, um, and his first assignment was documenting a 3,741-mile crossing of Antarctica by dog sled, which sounds like that must have been quite an adventure. Um, he's written 11 books and produced and directed more than 30 documentaries. Uh, the feature-length ones include Dear President Obama, Antarctica, On the Edge, After the Spill, and Ghost Fleet. And Oceans 8, which I think you'll tell us a little bit more about, um, that project took him and his teams around the world by sea kayak over the course of 10 years. Uh, stories ranging from the Aleutian Islands to French Polynesia, Gabon to Tasmania, and more. And reporting on the one ocean and its various coastlines are faring in today's busy world, a topic that's very, very, very near and dear to the hearts of all the design programs, but the urban design students in particular um, are dealing with the Hudson Valley this semester and then uh, in the spring uh, when they go abroad and take kind of a global lens that are design issues, the notion of water and water infrastructures and water as a system becomes um, of the utmost importance as it is, of course, one of the most critical issues of our time. Um, lives in Hudson Valley and works there and had, for the past few years um, have focused on a series of short films about the environmental risks and the hopes for the Hudson River Valley, which of course is the birthplace of the American environmental movement. Um, I also am going to ask John in the conversation a little bit about his work as a visiting lecturer at Bard College uh, in the Environment and Urban Studies Department because I also ha obviously have a personal interest in the ways in which these kinds of tools are taught. Uh, to the future, not only designers, but environmentalists um, and other practitioners, whether they be uh, doctors or artists or what have you. And I would encourage everyone to tune into his weekly podcast, The Green Radio Hour, at radiokingston.org. After John speaks, uh, we're going to hear from Nellie Herman, who's the creative director of the program in narrative medicine right here at Columbia. Um, She's published two novels, The Cure for Grief and The Season of Migration, which was a New York Times editor's choice, and her nonfiction has appeared in an anthology about siblings, um, as well as in academic medicine. She's been an invited resident to numerous residencies, such as Malay, UCross, the Salt and Soul Foundation, and has taught fiction and narrative medicine to undergrads, medical students, graduate students, and clinicians of all sorts. Um, she was the recipient of a 2016 NEA Literature Fellowship and was recently awarded a Cullman Fellowship of New York Public Library. 
Uh, and then finally, we will hear from Aisha Williams, an art practitioner who is the deputy director of a very cool organization called the Laundromat Project. Uh, she's over a decade of experience working with visual artists, presenting programs, and generating funding for both commercial galleries and nonprofits. She used to manage visual arts at Lincoln Center, which was a comprehensive program providing visual arts offerings and experiences to all the audience and supporters of that vast and complex cultural complex. Um, and before that was the director of the Kent Gallery. Uh, she's also on the board of the Marcus Garvey Park Alliance and the Possibility Project, and has served as a steering committee member of the UN Women's Conference in 2016. Uh, so we're going to hear from each of these uh, narrative practitioners, if I may categorize you as such, um, each individually, and then we'll all join together for a conversation, starting with uh, John. Thank you. This semester at Bard, I'm teaching a class called uh, Multimedia Environmental Storytelling, and it's a semester, it's a project-based class, and, and uh, the, the, the goal is that uh, each student, uh, their upper, upper class students, choo they choose one uh, from column A, which is subject matter, and it could be an environmental issue, specific, specifically a, a local issue if possible. Uh, and then one from column B, which is the medium that they want to tell that story in. And it can be the classic, it could be nonfiction, or it could be a podcast, or it could be a film, et cetera. But it also could be dance, or literature, or, or theater, or or painting, you know, that, that's completely up to them. But it was only when we got week into week five that I, some, one of the students asked me, again, the class is called Multimedia Environmental Storytelling, and I got into week five, one of the students very shyly asked me in front of the rest of the students, um, how do you tell a story? So these are exceedingly bright uh, young students. Uh, they've been taught to write really well. Uh, but it's mostly essays, and mostly comes from kind of their inner inner dialogue. It's not about going out and, and essentially reporting a story. Uh, and I just thought, well, okay, obviously I need to back up a second. Um, and and I was taken back a little bit because that's what I do. I, I, my whole life has been storytelling, so I just assumed that everybody could tell a story. And, and for me, it's instinctual, but I assumed that that just came naturally to everyone. Um, you saw in Kasim's introduction a lot of that, a lot of reference to National Geographic, but that came, you know, kind of into my my writing career a little bit. I was born in the middle of the of, of the United States in Illinois in a little town called Normal, and uh, I didn't I didn't travel. I my, I've never I was never on an airplane with my parents. Um, that wasn't the life we had. Uh, I was a voracious reader. I, I do great talks in schools because teachers love me because I say I learned everything and got inspired by by books and and but a lot of it was kind of classic you know manly man stuff you know Jack London and Ernest Hemingway and and there was a magazine back then called Boys Life I think which is now essentially outside magazine and, and men's journal and, and National Geographic Adventure on steroids um, but, and so I, I knew I was going to write when I went to college. I, I, you know, when they ask you and you, you apply to, you know, fill out a line that says, what do you want to be when you grow up? I literally said sports reporter, because I thought, what could be better? You know, go to the ball game, have a hot dog, a beer, you, you know, you write, the, write the, and I tried it for a couple of years while I was in college. It was so boring, so boring. It's repetitive, you know, every day you just fill in a new name, a new, you know, so-and-so scored X, so-and-so hit a home run in the bottom of the seventh. It, it just didn't change. So I abandoned that. But I stuck with the writing. Um, but my journalism degrees are, are, are in that, in, in journalism. And I started as a print reporter and writer. And for, you know, a good 20 years, I made a, a really good living, actually, writing uh, for magazines and, and books. Um, I dabbled a little bit in, in film just as, as it came, came about. My argument always for, because I've, I've never taken a film class, but I've made more than 30 documentaries, but my argument always if you can, is, was that if you can tell a story, it didn't really matter what the medium was. You know, it's this, it, it, and some of the projects we did, like we went to uh, the Aleutian Islands and we went to Vietnam, and each of those projects was a magazine story for National Geographic, a book, a film, lectures, internet dispatches, but if you took them all and, and, and went through them, it's the same stories, you know, it's just different mediums. But that uh, National Geographic connection then morphed into a, a position where they, they kind of wanted, uh, you know, they, they were getting really good bang for their buck with me because I could write stories. 
Oftentimes, National Geographic will fund people who aren't necessarily good storytellers, and then they have to bring in someone else to help them. And in my case, because I could already tell stories, they were pretty confident they could just send me out and they didn't have to pay somebody else. So they got off pretty cheaply, and I just started making films as part of the whole process. And again, it was basically same reporting skills, same storytelling skills, just uh, with some technology involved uh, <coughs> that was, that was uh, eye-opening. I, I, I like the fact when, that Kasim's little bio, or my bio, I guess, referenced uh, that we did this big project that took 10 years where we went around the world one continent at a time by sea kayak, looking at uh, the relationship between man and the ocean. How many people on the planet? Nobody? Don't be shy. How many people on the planet? We'll call it 7.3 billion, 7.4 billion, something like that. How many live within stone's throw of the ocean, or an ocean, the ocean, or the one ocean? Almost, more, more than half, four billion people live within easy access to the world's ocean, the world's one ocean. If you, if you go home and flip open your National Geographic uh, atlas, you'll find uh, five oceans listed. You know, Atlantic, Pacific, Indian, Arctic, and the Southern Ocean, which goes around Antarctica. But if you go home and spin your National Geographic globe, you'll see pretty easily that it's all just one big body of water. It covers 70% of the planet. So anyway, it was just incredible fodder for stories out there. It was never ending. But as, as part of that, <clears throat> uh, we did we, we this 10, ten year long project uh, got me quite into water and water related issues and then at, for 10 years after that we made documentaries we made a couple in Antarctica we made a couple in Louisiana a um, few more all with kind of ocean related subjects themes and but then I thought you know I live here in the Hudson Valley where I've lived for, for 30 years I just I'm just 90 miles straight up the Hudson River from from you guys I want to come back and take Kasim's class in the, in the summer. Um, but I kind of thought, you know, the, you, you don't have to travel halfway around the world to find good adventure. You don't have to travel halfway around the world to find good stories. So I, I have a small uh, team of, of people who work with me, and we kind of took a big, deep breath and said, okay, let's make movies here at home. Let's tell stories here at home. So we started a, a project called... Uh, Initially, it was called the Hudson River at Risk, and we looked at uh, kind of environmental concerns uh, up and down the river. Maybe I'll show you a little clip from that. How's that? past couple decades, I'm lucky to have been able to travel around the world literally continent by continent, often by sea kayak, looking at the health of the planet's coastlines, estuaries, and rivers. This Hudson River Valley has such a rich history of both in terms of its wildlife and its people, you know, going back to the Native Americans who used this same Hudson River as a corridor for transporting pelts and fish to the modern day where there are 20 million people who live near the edges of its shoreline and use the river for commerce as well. Wars have been waged here, pirates once lived at its mouth, and industries have boomed and busted up and down the river. Brick making, cement, iron mines, commercial fishing, which has led to incredible riches over the years, but also grave consequences. That industrial revolution had a great impact on the river and its valley's wildlife. It was a pattern of pollution that ravaged the river into the 1960s and 1970s, and in some instances continues today. Today, of course, instead of pelts and fish, the cargo moving up and down the river is largely oil and gas in unprecedented volume by both train and barge. An aging nuclear plant sits just 35 miles from the heart of New York City, awaiting a decision to relicense it or not. 
and the biggest construction project in North America, the $4 billion rebuilding of the Tappan Zee Bridge, provides jobs but threatens the river's ecosystem. It's clear to anyone who spends time on the Hudson today that it is both an incredibly rich resource but also still a river at risk. So that, that was just a little tease we made after we'd made, I think, a half dozen of the films that looked at these risks, and the risks were, risks were pretty straightforward. Um, you know, I was quite involved in the effort to ban fracking in New York State, and that was, a success, that was successful in 2014. The governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, uh, disallowed fracking in, 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 in the state. Um, but while we were patting ourselves on the back for this grassroots uh, effort, uh, all the ancillary businesses of the gas and oil industry, including pipelines and crude oil being moved by barges and by train, came ro roaring through the Hudson Valley. So we took a look at that. You saw that, those, that image of uh, Indian Point, the uh, uh, nuclear power plant that, that uh, sits it's 35 miles from Times Square, so it's you know, only 30 miles from here. Um, and we you know, looked at a bunch of other environmental concerns, and I took them around. We identified that there were 300 groups up and down the Hudson River that work on environmental issues. And so I took them, th these films up and down the river as a way to, because I'm a big believer that media, and I guess in this context, storytelling can make a big difference. And they, they worked. I mean, there, several of these films that we worked on were used as tools to help educate consumers to, to complain about certain environmental issues, and they worked. They, you know, they, the transport of crude oil by train and barge is largely slowed. There was a pipeline that was going to run from uh, Albany to New Jersey that has been forgotten. Um, and, and Indian Point is going to close in 2021, 2022. So and the, these little films can help make a difference. But to be quite honest, I, I showed them so much that I got bummed out. So uh, we pivoted and we said, okay, we're only gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna focus on good news stories. Because this is the problem with a lot of environmental storytelling today is it only focuses on the, on the dark side and the bad. So we start, decided we'd, start, we'd do a whole new series just called Hope on the Hudson. So I think I've got a couple of clips here I can show you. And these are just tiny little clips from existing films. Mahikanatuk is the name that the Hudson River had long before it was called the Hudson River. Right now in this time, there are indigenous people around this continent and the world that are standing up in ways that they haven't for a long time. And they're standing up for water. Water is life. Water is what goes through us. Water is what we are composed of. The clear water is a tool of the heart, as all human tools are. They're tools of the heart. That's what brings people along and makes them want to be here for 35 years and care about the organization. It's greeting public. It's educating kids. It's making the boat work. It's playing music together. It's carrying the fire forward. What Clearwater has is a beautiful boat that is sitting on the Hudson River that goes through the water of life, that ancient highway that is Mahikanatuk, the Hudson River. So do you all know about the, the sloop Clearwater? It's kind of an educational environmental environmental education boat. You have to, if you want to see the boat itself, you have to watch the whole movie, which is online at HudsonRiverStories.com. Um, but this is very, you know, it's it's celebrating its 50th anniversary. We filmed it while it was in uh, repair for for a year and a half or so. But very sweet and and very uplifting and very uh, powerful little film. Um, we also, you know, I have a great interest in water and water related stories, but we're looking at all sorts of environmental issues, so we've also made several films about local agricultural issues. 
This is, a, uh, this is based on a big teaching, a nonprofit teaching farm uh, in the Hudson Valley where they experiment a lot with, uh, with new, new products and, uh, and, and because they have a lot of space and a lot of money, they're able to do things that smaller farms can't do. This is a story of healing through many generations. A great, great granddaughter who is allowed to speak her language. This is the story of a mother who sings the songs of the sacred corn to her children. This is a story of children being proud of who they are and where they come from. This is the story of my great, great grandmother's dreams and wishes coming to life in the beat of the water drum and the seeds of the rattle. This is the story of intergenerational resilience coming alive to dance into another day. So the, film, the film is called Seeds of Hope and it's about efforts to regrow uh, Native American seeds which have become near to extinct, including one species of red corn that was down to literally two ears, two ears of red corn, and they brought it here to the, to the farm hub in the Hudson Valley and have nurtured it, and now they produce thousands of pounds a year of this red corn, and the Aquasazini come down, and they take all the food back to their, uh, where they now live. Uh, but, you know, it, it's an optimistic, hopeful story, but it's also a very sad story because you're, you're reminded that this land in the Hudson Valley used to be theirs, and now they've been kicked out and moved up to the Canadian border where it's really a miserable place to grow. And, and so as a result, they, they, they've run out of the ability to, to produce their own food. So you know, not, not everything is, is as hopeful as it, as it may seem. But anyway, very sweet story. I encourage you to, to, to look for them. Um, you know, there's a million ways to tell a story, maybe thousands, I, I don't know. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing what these guys have to say in terms of how they produce their stories. But these are mine. Um, again, I'm a big believer that media makes a difference um, in, in a good way. And we've come in recent few years to think of the media as being only arbiters of, or you know, carriers of, of bad news. But I think there's also a really easy way to find good in these stories as well. So thanks for coming in. That was amazing. Thank you, John. It was really great to see video. I have no. I have a blank screen for you. Um, I understand that is not usual in your world, but I um, don't use slides, so I hope that's okay. Um, I. My name's Nellie. I'm here um, as a writer and also as the uh, creative director in the program in narrative medicine. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and my own personal work and then also mainly about how I came to be in this program and what our program does sort of from my own angle of things because the program does many, many things. Um, so just to start, I'll start with sort of a basic elevator speech of what is narrative medicine because that question gets asked constantly. Um, and probably everyone involved in the work would give you a slightly different answer. Um, but my answer is usually something about um, that we work with stories and storytelling in healthcare, specifically um, trying to get healthcare practitioners to under some, understand something about how stories work so that they can then be better at their jobs. That's really what I usually say. Um, it was really interesting to hear Kasim start us off talking about you guys learning the tools of storytelling in order to be better designers, because that's kind of basically what we're trying to do as well, although maybe, the, maybe the, some of the tools that we're sharing might be a little different, although we do also do qualitative research and um, teaching the students about those kinds of things. But um, really, we focus more on what happens when we tend to focus more on literature. What happens when you read a story 
um, as a way of getting people to, to quickly access what a story is and what, you know, if you pay attention to what happens to you when you read a story and what are the things you notice, what are you listening for, all those things, you then can translate that into what happens when you're listening to a story, when you're interacting with an actual human being. And the theory is that really medicine in, in pretty much all ways is storytelling. I mean, the whole work of medicine is listening to stories, be it, be it actually listening to the language that someone is telling you about what is wrong with them, but also being able to analyze their body language, being able to notice details like in the presentation that you're being given. I mean, in so many ways, you're, you're being asked to understand and interpret stories. So we kind of take the view that if we can make people better readers in, in, in all senses of that word, um, then they might be better at reading patients and being of help to their patients. Um, and it's not just for doctors. We, we work with all kinds of healthcare practitioners. Um, so backing up from that, just my own um, personal, by the way, I'm not paying attention to time. I hope you, okay. Um, I thought there'd be a clock here, but I don't see one. Um, um, just my own journey into the work, I, I did my, I was always a writer, um, creative writer, and specifically a fiction writer. Um, and when I was in high school, a, a series of unfortunate things happened to family members of mine. So I spent a lot of time in hospitals, not as a patient myself, but as watching my family members be patients. Um, and I, I lost two of my family members when I was in high school. And through all of that um, grief and trauma, I was writing. And writing was just the way that I always, since I was a little kid, processed what I went through. Um, without, you know, it wasn't conscious. It was just how I, I didn't really talk to my family or to my friends about what was going on. I actually would just sit and write about it. Um, so, then I went, you know, graduated high school and went to college. And after college, I came to Columbia to do my MFA in fiction writing. And I knew then that I, I mean, I always knew I wa wanted to write a book about what had happened in my family and in my youth. But I didn't know if I wanted, well, should I write a memoir? Should I write a f novel? I wanted to write a novel, but I didn't know how. Anyway, all of that I can talk for longer about. But um, while I was in grad school, I started writing my novel, which would be my first novel, um, which was about my family story. And at the same time, I also learned that there was this program called Narrative Medicine that existed up at the um, medical school, and that they were looking for MFA students to go and teach a fiction writing workshop to the medical students. So I very much volunteered and applied to go do that, and I went up to the hospital to teach a very short, like six week workshop to medical students. And the experience of doing that was completely transformative to me, in, I think for lots of reasons, partly because, um, well in large part just because I had been around doctors in this very personal way, um, the idea that I, was, that I was interacting with students that would be doctors and that they thought that I had something to teach them was just completely, revelatory, um, and seeing these students react to the, the tools that I had been working on for years, just very basic skills of creative work, and sort of, I would ask them to write a silly creative exercise, and they would look at me like I was crazy, you know, because they just never had been asked to do work like that, and for me, for me and all my classmates, it was completely normal. Um, and that it was really exciting for me, to think that like, oh, wait, this creative work can translate into other environments and can be of help and of interest to these people who are then going to go on and actually, you know, potentially save lives. Um, so that was the first, my first experience with narrative medicine, and I was completely hooked. And then I pursued a job with the program for many years, um, and it was took many years to get one. But um, I then, in the meantime, I finished my first book and worked to publish that and wasn't really even aware of all the ways that that book that I was working on really actually was narrative medicine or was narrative medicine to me in the sense that it was 
creating a work of art that was actually transforming my own experience and my own story, which is now what I try to do with students um, and with people I work with in the program. So after I published that book, I ended up getting a job in the program um, where I then worked, you know, found myself working in the hospital, um, you know, going to faculty meetings with faculty at the hospital and trying to, to talk to them about how to work with student writing, because at Columbia, as, as well as in many other medical schools across the country, they, more and more schools are working with student writing as a way to, they, they call it reflective writing in, in medical school as opposed to creative writing, but to my mind it's pretty much the same. Um, but, you know, as a, as a way to get students to sort of process what they're going through, they're asking them to write. But of course, faculty at medical schools often don't know what to do with the writing that they're being given, um, and it's pretty problematic frankly, the way that it's being taught is not, they don't, most places don't have novelists on the faculty. They have people who, you know, are very well-meaning and care about what they're doing, but don't, aren't necessarily trained in what's, what storytelling is or what creativity is. So it can be problematic. Um, obviously more to say about that too. Um, so anyway, I worked at the medical school for a while. I then, um, was working on my second novel, which I eventually, the second novel I wrote is a, about the early life of Vincent Van Gogh. It has absolutely nothing to do with me, which was a lot of the point. Um, I wanted to challenge myself to write a book that wasn't about me, because the first one very much was, and um, in, only in retrospect do I see all the ways that it really was about me without my knowing, but that's also another story. Um, but anyway, I worked to do that, and in the meantime, I, I moved away from the, the sort of nine to five job that I had at the hospital and more into teaching, which, which I do now still in the graduate school, um, the graduate program for narrative medicine, where we get many um, students coming, I would say the, pro, the Primary students we get are students coming out of college before they go to medical school um, or to pr health professional school of various kinds. Um, so that's the teaching that I do now. Um, so I, I wanted to say a little bit just about the sort of basic pedagogy of what we do in the program, which is not, there really isn't one thing, but I would say the, the usual thing that we do is that we sit in a small group of, well, actually you could do it in a big group too, but um, depending on the environment, you sit and you, we just share um, examples of writing, poem or an excerpt from a short story. Um, it's, it is pretty much always a, a work of creative writing. It's not, we don't, we don't look at essays, we don't look at, you know, academic texts, we're really looking at literature, um, and specifically also not medical related things. Um, I think a lot of people who do the work or, or think they know what the work is share, you know, oh, here's a story about a doctor and a patient and that's what we should read, but we actually try and not do that because it can be really freeing for people to be looking at something that's not about medicine. Um, and then we ask them to write in basically in the shadow of what we've just spent time talking about. We give them a writing prompt, and the prompt is usually very open-ended. It's not like, you know, please reflect on the patient that you just saw yesterday and what you would do differently. It's more like write about a gate or, you know, write about the time you, a time that you, I don't know, I can't even think of one off the top of my head, but they're very open-ended and hopefully eliciting creative responses and people get really freaked out and you know initially don't really want to do this but when really like every single time when people put themselves through the act of doing this thing that makes them feel vulnerable they come out the other side you know completely excited about it and um, what has become my sort of angle into the work and my thing that I now sort of proselytize about in the program is just basically the idea that all, each of us are practicing creativity in all kinds of ways throughout our days, no matter what we do, and to, the, to start to become aware of the way that we 
do that and to actively cultivate it and use it in our work. It just makes us better at whatever we're doing. Um, and you know, a couple of years into the work, I realized that no one really used that word in, in which makes sense. I mean, there's a big stigma around that word in lots of contexts, but certainly in medicine, the word creativity is not embraced usually. Um, so that's kind of become my, my thing is like pushing that we actually start using that word and start not letting it be moved to the sidelines, but actually something that people can be proud that they're doing. Um, and when people do do the work and uh, you know undergo these little acts of creativity, they share with each other. They, I mean, amazing things happen. Just not only in what happens in your own processing of your own experience, but also in the the teamwork that can happen in a room when a group of people have worked with a certain patient and didn't know that they shared feelings or experiences with that same patient and then five of them write about that patient and you know it, many various things that can happen I can go into more. Um, I don't know where I am in time, is that okay? All right. That's why <laughs> we'll talk more. Thank you. So when folks saw the description for today and saw the laundromat project, who thought that I was going to talk about owning a laundromat? <laughs> that is definitely not what we do. Um, so I believe this is. Yeah. So the laundromat project is an arts organization. Um, we were officially incorporated in 2005. Um, we simply advance artists and neighbors as change agents in their own communities. Uh, as an organization, we work at the intersection of art, community building, and social justice. So um, we believe in the uh, power of creativity as a tool to drive change within uh, local communities. So we are hyper-local with a national view. Uh, of things in the world and kind of understanding that real shifts and movements in society and culture happen on the ground directly in communities where we live, work, breathe, grow, share time with one another. Um, and so we are called the Laundromat Project uh, because uh, we uh, consider the idea of a laundromat as a communal space um, where folks can come together, meet their neighbors. So um, I am not a native New Yorker. I've been here for about 16 years. But uh, the idea of New York City as being this really vast space where we all share um, where we share space together with one another, um, and we are deeply connected to one another, and might not even necessarily pass by our neighbor um, on our regular everyday routes or just through um, our regular everyday motion. Uh, the idea of a laundromat as a space where you're literally standing there doing your laundry, and during the spin cycle, you can be standing next to your neighbor and engage in conversation, get to know and learn about one another, uh, and really talk about issues that are of particular concern within your community. So uh, the laundromat is a metaphor for a community space. Uh, we actually did in the beginning of the organization um, when we first started doing art projects, and I will go deeper into that and you'll see some examples of those. Um, we uh, literally propped up a, a folding table in front of a laundromat and uh, an artist by the name of Rudy Shepard um, sat down and started taking or drawing portraits of uh, folks who were walking by the laundromat. And so um, people would stop and they heard about this guy who was drawing people's portraits and wanted a portrait of themselves to put up in their home. Uh, and while Rudy was uh, taking portraits of folks, uh, he would begin to engage in conversation, get to learn about them, get to know about them, and it became an exchange of knowledge and information. Uh, and he became like the local portrait maker. So where some folks you know, just saw him as a neighbor, they started to actually view him as someone who had these particular skill sets uh, that could be used to create uh, community uh, within uh, within their hyperlocal space, and so simply. Uh, the way that we do our work, uh, we make art and culture and community while fostering leadership among our neighbors through a residency programs. So we actually uh, provide financial resources and support and mentorship to up to five artists a year who actually want to uh, understand and learn better how to use their creative practice to go into their communities uh, to uh, uh, work around a particular issue uh, of concern in that community. We are citywide, so these projects pop up um, all 
all around New York City. We actually, over the past 14, going on 15 years, uh, we've done projects in every single borough in New York City. We have done one project in Staten Island, so we can claim all of the boroughs um, across the city. Uh, we also have a fellowship program where uh, we train up to uh, 10 artists every year folks who might have recently just came come out of grad school or people who want to have a deeper understanding about what it means to create a community engaged place-based work. Uh, and then in addition, we actually have a brick and mortar space. We have a two bedroom apartment uh, that is in the South Bronx in a section of the South Bronx called Longwood. And it's literally an apartment. Uh, it has a bathroom with a shower. It has a kitchen um, and uh, no one lives there. No one can live there. Uh, but we create, we, uh, with the neighbors on the block itself, so we do workshops, uh, we have, um, uh, there's a community garden sitting right next, uh, behind the apartment, um, where we do cross-collaborative workshops, uh, anything from taking the local herbs in the garden and learning how to do dyes and then turning that into printmaking practices, um, and things of that nature. So, uh, I will show you some examples of that as well as I advance through, but simply that's, uh, the programmatic part of what we do. And um, I will show a quick video to give you an example. A Living Room on Roosevelt is a public art project that engages local community in conversations about issues of community safety as connected to immigration, displacement, and policing. And we're having those conversations in a living room installation that was inspired by my living room growing up. The project is also a collaborative effort with Queens Neighborhoods United, which is a local grassroots organization that works around issues of criminalization and displacement in Jackson Heights. Working with Ro on the project has been an amazing experience and has actually taught me a lot about our, my own community uh, and talking to individuals about the topics that we have at hand. I've actually gotten to hear from the community stories and experiences of the topic so that way we can use in a research project that we're doing about Roosevelt Avenue in Jackson Heights and Corona. I am a self-taught, multidisciplinary artist. I work in mixed media, collage, installation, photography, and writing. And a lot of my practice has to do with investigating memory and intimacy, especially in relation to place, history, and trauma. We shouldn't be ashamed to talk about these subjects like immigration, displacement, and policing. We're able to talk about it in public. I think that makes people feel like they're part of a community. A lot of the pieces that are part of the installation really just were inspired by me sitting in my mom's living room and me looking at like a lot of the small details and really uh, acknowledging the labor and the creativity and intention that my mom put into those things. The record collection is actually also, it's not my mom's, but it's my stepdad and my uncle. They passed away a while ago, but they lived in the same apartment that I grew up in. So it's like bringing more of my family history into the space. One of the most important lessons that I've learned with my work with the LP is that our communities are already rich with creativity. And by bringing this living room installation into a public setting, we're asserting that like a lot of our everyday spaces are already spaces for creativity and for connection. So for us at the Laundry Project, and I think me personally, um, I am a consumer of stories. I have, uh, I'm just curious about everything um, and really interested in, in digging deep and understanding people's motivation um, and passions uh, around what they do. And so at the Laundry Project, uh, we truly believe that art and storytelling are inextricably, inextricably linked um, to one another. And so uh, for me, a good piece of art is a piece of art that tells a story that takes me to another place and helps me and understand and exploring um, different things that I didn't know before um, I encountered the piece of artwork. Uh, it opens up new worlds uh, and, and creates a different way of seeing the world and understanding how to build the world uh, that better reflects um, me, my people, all the things. Um, at the LP, we are, um, and, and I will go into this, but at the LP, we we are a people of color centered organization, uh, intersectional and inclusive. And so in thinking of that, we are particularly interested in what it means to tell our own stories and tell our own narratives. Um, as people of color who are living within New York City, how do you reclaim particular narratives around a place um, and actually own and change the narrative that's built around that? How do you hold on to your stories and share them out with others? 
And so um, one question that we constantly ask ourselves and the artists are always asking are coming to us as they're developing their projects is how do we use our stories, voices, and language to build lasting community power? Um, and so one project in particular uh, that's very much centered around this is a project that's called We the News, and it's by an artist, her name is Lizanya Cruz. She's a Dominican, uh, a Dominican uh, immigrant. She recently moved to the country about three years ago, and uh, she was particularly interested in reclaiming the narrative around what it means to be an immigrant. And so for each of our projects, because we are a place-based, hyper-local organization, we understand that uh, we can share and hold space for the telling of stories, but the people who actually live in the neighborhoods, who grew up in the neighborhoods, who are descendants of the folks who built the neighborhoods can tell their story better than we ever could ourselves. And so for each of the projects that we do, all of the artists have to partner with a community-based organization in order to work and build community, in order to develop and tell the stories, create projects around that. Um, and so her community partner for her project was an organization called the Black Alliance for Just Immigration. It is a, um, an organizing, uh, a legal-based organizing organization. They do a lot of work around um, helping provide legal services to recent Caribbean and African immigrants to the country um, and helping folks navigate through particular issues related to documentation and things of that nature. And Lizanya lives in Bed-Stuy, and so what she did was she gathered a number of different story circles with uh, recent immigrants, uh, like I mentioned, Caribbean and African that were based in Bed-Stuy, and they just sat around uh, in a circle and told stories about what it means to be an immigrant, what it feels like to be far away from home, what it feels like to create a new home in this particular space. Um, and those uh, story circles were then translated into um, zines. Uh, Lizanya is a graphic designer by practice, and you see the zines that are on the news cart there. And each one of the zines are free and available to the public, and the news cart actually is, is mobile. So it folds up into a box, you can unfold it into a newsstand, and she traveled around Bed-Stuy um, and unfolded the newsstand and did a pop-up and allowed folks to just encounter the project and take away a zine, which gave them the ability to learn about or learn about the story of a, a recent immigrant. So again, reclaiming and owning our own narratives and actually um, uh, having ownership over the way that our stories are told. And so um, one of the things uh, that is embedded in the work that we do is our tagline, we make art, which is, we make art. Uh, we build community, which is the community building part of what we do. And then all of that is done in order to create change. Uh, so how do we create a world that is more just and equitable? Uh, and how do each one of these projects drive particular change that's not only local based, but then how does it ripple out into the broader society and the world? Um, and so one of the beautiful things about this collaboration that Lizanya did with Baji was each of the zines that were created um, during Baji's annual convening, um, they are based uh, their headquarters are based in Oakland, California, and they have one of their larging organizing offices here in Bed-Stuy. Um, and so they flew Lizanya out to Oakland, um, and she did a whole session during their convening. And uh, what happened was, as a takeaway, um, the organizers for Baji now use her zines as they go out and do a lot of the connecting um, with the immigrants and folks. Uh, so that is a, a ripple effect or a way that Lizanya is working with a local-based organization to then impact the work that they're doing to drive the narrative around immigration, uh, both locally and broadly. Um, another project that we supported was Oh my gosh, 2016, we're in 2019 now, right? 2016 and 2017, 2017. Um, we supported a project, I don't know how many people have been following um, uh, uh, the movement around um, taking down monuments and replacing them, uh, but there is a particular monument that is on a 105th and Park Avenue, Fifth Avenue. Um, it is of a, 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 it's a monument uh, of a doctor, his name is J. Marion Sims, um, who was a gynecologist and did a lot of um, experimentation on um, women of color, particularly Latina and black women of color, um, to uh, influence his uh, gynecological work. And so um, uh, there was a local organization called East Harlem Preservation who had done a lot of organizing around removing the statue. Um, it, it was just not right uh, for a doctor who was doing experimentation on the people uh, that are reflected within the local population. So this organization did a lot of organizing work and in 2016 or 2017, um, one of the artist uh, groups that we supported um, did a, a intervention or an activation around the monument to bring attention to um, 
um, the work of Dr. Sims and to try to move uh, uh, the conversation around the removal of the statue. And it has been taken down as of last year, and now there's actually an open call. There are a couple of artists that are being considered to replace the monument at this point. So again, reclaiming, retelling, resharing our narratives. And um, another story or another thing um, we are particularly focused on issues of concern within in communities. Uh, so this project in particular um, is a project by an artist. Her name is Ms. Walker. She grew up in the South Bronx and um, the South Bronx um, is heavily impacted and affected by environmental issues. Um, I think they have the highest rate of asthma um, uh, within New York City itself. Um, and it is a food desert um, and all of the various different um, issues that come along with um, uh, or environmental issues, they're, they're deeply impacted more so than any other neighborhood in New York City. And so for her project, what she did was she used this uh, Kiko, uh, the, the icy carts that go around on the, on the blocks every summer. Um, and so she used that as a tool in a way to actually encounter and engage with her neighbors so they could talk about issues of concern, environmental issues, issues of concern um, in their neighborhood in the South Bronx. And so in exchange for an IC, a free IC, um, you had to share a story. And as you shared that story, she actually created a, a mobile app that showed the, um, the air quality levels um, at that particular moment in time. So it was a way for her to track um, uh, the air quality um, and paired that with a particular story of someone who was deeply impacted by environmental issues and uh, they got an IC in exchange. And so I'll show you a quick video of this project. Okay, so my project, Coco Climate Cart, is a food vending cart slash mobile installation that engages the Hunts Point and Longwood community. The whole idea is that people come up to the car and tell me a, their story and experience about the weather, especially summertime in 2016, and then they get an icy treat in exchange. Being raised in Hunts Point and growing up around the community center to point, I was able to be exposed about environmental justice and racism and systematic racism and how it impacted my community. So a lot of my artistic practice is taking those theories of how my community identity was shaped through a lot of policy making and a lot of burdens that we face environmentally. It was getting people to talk about climate change and connect it to what they already know but people don't talk about. Also, because here in this community, we are a waterfront, and we experience Hurricane Sandy, and some people who were really in the coastal area were impacted, and we got people to talk about those things. So I see in long run, a project like this can continue to impact more engagement in those issues. Monetary currency is not involved with it, so the idea of exchanging your story and someone wanting to hear your story, um, I've been finding that really interesting, where a lot of people's like, wow, you want to hear what I have to say? I have something to tell you. And also just being able to create a safe space where we're able to hear each other so people feel comfortable to share things about like not having heat, not having money, or personal things that are, they don't, maybe it's embarrassing to say, but it really is important. And especially in talking about climate change and how this all relates to each other. It allowed me to grow and build myself as an artist outside of school to really see how I deal with like real world challenges. And I learned with the LP to just step back. I want the community to feel like they can create art. I want them to have control and there's no wrong answers. And how to do that, not so much as an artist, but someone that's like a listener of my community. I didn't realize until this project, it's hard to get one of those icy carts. <laughs> it's very, very complicated. Um, but that's another example of some of the work that we do. And, and the final example I'll share with you about one of the artist projects that we're supporting. It's a project we're currently supporting. It's called um, uh, Here to Stay Housing, uh, Here to Stay Housing for the People Mapping Project. It's by an artist collective called Chinatown Art Brigade. Um, they do a lot of organizing down in Chinatown Lower East Side, um, uh, organizing around issues of gentrification and displacement, particularly with the rapidly gentrifying um, uh, uh, that rapid 
properly gentrifying area of the city. Um, and what their project is mainly based around is uh, documenting the history of the neighborhood and archiving the history of the neighborhood because the neighborhood will soon not look like the neighborhood that it originally was. So they go around and they've created a map um, which you can see a little bit of the map down there. Um, and they have local residents go in and actually tell stories of particular sites um, uh, uh, of significance to them. Uh, and so there's actually a QR code you hover over and what pops up is a video of someone telling the story of that particular section of the neighborhood. Um, and it's a way to, like I said, reflect what the neighborhood looked like. Um, but what it also is used for, um, um, large part of that population are not English speaking um, and uh, have a lot of issues particularly when related to displacement um, uh, around being uh, evicted from their homes. And so what the map is used for as well is a tool so that when they go into housing court, they're actually able to um, tell, discuss, um, point to, and connect um, how they are impacted um, by the change that's happening um, uh, currently right now within, within the Lower East Side in Chinatown. And uh, so one part of what we do is support artists as they go out into communities uh, using their creative practice to have issues around, or to speak about issues um, that are happening within their neighborhoods. But as an organization, we wanted to understand how we actually have those conversations as well. So one way that we do this uh, is through, like I mentioned, the brick and mortar space that we have in the South Bronx is called Kelly Street Collaborative. Um, so it's a two bedroom apartment where we work uh, with local uh, neighbors on a particular block in the South Bronx it's called Kelly Street, it's an historic block in the Bronx. Um, and we listen to what they say they want to talk about or what they want to engage in and we create programming around that. So uh, we do uh, workshops with the youth on the block. Um, we do workshops with the adults on the block. Uh, we teach folks, or we bring in teaching artists to teach folks how to um, make uh, teas and make uh, facial scrubs and uh, how to do doll making and how to do print making and creating zines that tell their stories. We have yoga sessions, it's Saturday yogas, um, every day where folks can come in and learn about health and wellness and how that impacts their everyday. Um, and uh, during that time, uh, we collect and share and tell stories and learn um, about what's happening in the neighborhood and learn about the history of the neighborhood. And we can take that and turn that into a tool that we use to then go out and tell those stories even beyond. Um, and uh, that is Kelly Street. And so, I'm just scanning through really quickly, make sure I get there and I can go more deeply into a lot of these projects. Um, but at the LP, just through the examples that I shared, we're constantly engaging with the artists and with our neighbors to understand um, what it means to tell a story and whose story are we telling. And so one thing that we were particularly holding ourselves accountable to when we're thinking about ourselves as storytellers is how we share and collect stories with honesty and transparency how we consider power dynamics as we're telling the story, so understanding who's the storyteller um, and who is sharing their story. Uh, we always constantly consider um, how we activate our archives, so understanding that archives are ever-changing and ever-evolving spaces, um, and understanding uh, when to go in and what to find and what to share within those archives itself. Um, we think about how we use memoir as a tool for advocacy, so understanding how we tell first-person narratives um, as a way to truly, uh, as an empowerment tool, um, an ability to actually hold and be able to share your own story. Um, we think about how we operas operationalize ethics, um, so uh, how, uh, how, how we do the work ethically. Um, and then uh, how we lean into accessibility. So thinking about uh, being able to tell stories in multi in uh, multilingual, um, as well as offering services around ASL. So opening up access so everyone has the ability to consume and share uh, their stories. The various ways that you guys approach what it is that you do in terms of the telling of stories have very, very important differences in terms of the sectors in which you work and the kinds of spaces and contexts in which you work, but also a tremendous amount of similarities and resonance. Um, something you said, Aisha, uh, particularly at the end, but that really ran through overtly your presentation was the notion of um, storytelling as, as empowering. Mm -hmm both empowering for the artists who you're sort of, you know, helping and supporting and sort of transforming into leaders and change, not transforming, but helping them transform themselves into leaders and change agents, but also how it can be empowering for the people interacting with 
those um, those projects and those platforms and how that can be sort of a, a tool of mm -hmm. empowerment. Um, which I think is really interesting also in terms of, Nelly, what you were talking about in terms of helping healthcare practitioners be better at what they're doing. And also, John, I wanted to hear from you a little bit more about what happens to the stories once they're out there in the world. You create these you know, beautiful stories in a multiplicity of formats, but then they, you kind of alluded to this, and I want to hear you talk about it a little bit more, then they can be used as tools in a variety of different contexts. You know, one might be a you know, cinematic auditorium context like this, but then I'm sure there are other ways in which these things live and have their own um, afterlife upon afterlife in terms of the way they're used as tools for empowerment and engagement and advocacy. Yeah. So I wonder if each of you guys could talk about, I don't know, power is maybe a, uh, an intense word, but the, the afterlife of some of these stories and, and if you see that that's kind of coming to be more understood mm -hmm. in the wider world, that stories and storytelling is power, both for good and ill, <laughs> um, is that starting to be more understood and accepted, or, or is that still? Are we still kind of fighting for um, people to recognize the power that stories wield? I we are always thinking about, um, and particularly interested in thinking about uh, storytelling in multimodal ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I think about now and the way that we live in the world and access and consume information. Your ability to share your story and then have the whole world hear it, like the moment that you share the story is an extremely empowering uh, thing that you can you know, go on and in ways that we never could before um, share widely and tell who we are and what we do. Um, anecdotally, I just recently had a conversation with my grandmother um, that uh, will be shared publicly in podcast form but literally sitting next to her and she was you know, just saying, I've never been able to tell my story before in this way, holding on to this knowledge and information for so long, but to be able to be provided with a tool that allows you to share that out can open up the world in so many different ways. So I think that just in the way that we're consuming information and consuming media now, um, I think it's becoming more recognized as a, as a tool of power um, that we can wield freely without being told to or given permission to do so. Do you see that too, John, in your work in terms of giving, uh, telling stories that then become advocacy tools in their own right? Uh, absolutely, yeah. And I, I, I didn't mention it, but it's a big part of, of our storytelling experience, this, especially the last decade, is that my uh, you know, you know, universe, university experience was in uh, classic journalism, you know, which was uh, supposed to be objective, and that's supposed to take sides. And you know, I practiced that to a certain degree for, for a long time, but in the la certainly in the last decade, I've, I've, I've consciously made the decision that I don't have to be objective anymore, that there are lots of uh, issues out there that I have enough experience and knowledge on, I can make, it, I can make my own call. I don't encourage that for if you're 25, to be honest. I think you still need to kind of f learn a lot and, and figure, figure things out, but when you get to be uh, a bit uh, grayer, uh, I think it's legitimate for you to, to take a side. And specifically, yeah, so I've morphed from journalism into activism. I mean, I really think that what we, the, these films we're making are, are social tools. And a big part of what we do is, is sharing. And that's a huge part of it. Uh, it's no good to take them and put them in, in a drawer and, and, not sh and try and privatize them, you know. So they're all online, you can watch them kind of immediately. And we do lots and lots and lots of, uh, you know, sharing in, in, with public audiences, and we always have a, a Q and A afterwards. And often, the Q and A lasts longer than the films. Mm -hmm. You know, because all the films do, all the stories do, is kind of incite uh, questions, incite curiosity, and then people want to know. And especially in this day and age, especially again since November of 2016, people really want to know what can I do, how can I be involved, how, you know, especially uh, also on a on a local level, on a neighborhood level. So. And then do people, with the, in the case of the Hudson River stuff, do people then take them and show them in their own on the self-organized context? They can, mm -hmm. certainly. Uh, you know, we kind of like to be involved so that we can help organize and, and share in the right way. But again, they're all online. Also, you know, they are all online, but I, I, I usually don't tell people that because I want them to come to the events because I want them to see who their neighbors are. 
I want them to see who they, you know, who they agree with or don't agree with, and and I want them to be able to ask questions of. I, I don't participate in the in the in the Q and A. It's right. it's the locals who are familiar with these, whatever the subject matter of the day is. Right. And Nelly, obviously, like in terms of power dynamics, there's a tremendous power dynamic always in clinical contexts, uh, whether it's a doctor, or a nurse, or or a, or a psychiatric professional, or what have you, a social worker even. Um, and one, one thing that, that jumped out when, in reading the description of narrative medicine was this concept of, I think it's termed like radical listening, or is there something like that in the, in the course description? Um, but I wonder, how do you guys think, or how do you think, you, I think you, you spoke so beautifully about how transformative it can be, well, both for you, but also for your students who, in many cases, are going on to be healthcare practitioners, um, to be able to process what they're going through and observing through the power of storytelling. Um, but how do you think it influences the way in which they think about their patients as subjects with agency and... Um, it's such a complicated question. <laughs> I'm sitting here like trying to wrap my head around an answer. Um, I mean, you know, one thing I think is different sitting in between these to be, I mean, I, I don't, there's no product, you mm -hmm. know, there's no, it's more about like what, what do these, how do these tools, how can these to tools help you um, and help your work, but, and then, you know, this question of power, like, you know, certainly, I mean, the whole other conversation is the world of patient narratives, which are, you know, coming more and more, coming out more and more, um, and patients feeling like they can raise their voice against things that they witness in the medical world. But it's interesting to work, because we work mainly with practitioners in the sense that they most often don't feel, I mean, for good reason, don't feel that they can tell some of the, they don't want to tell these stories because they don't want to expose their patients mm -hmm. or, you know, HIPAA rules and all, all many other reasons why they're not able to you can't easily write about what happens in medicine. So it's, and we've kind of gotten around those questions mainly by just focusing on, okay, we're not, we're not turning you into writers. We're really just kind of trying to get you to play with what these tools are and how the act of writing and thinking and being creative, not only in writing, I mean, we do do work in other mediums too, but um, how, the, how the act of doing these things might then change other parts of your life, not necessarily make you want to be a writer. Um, anyway, I've gotten way yeah, off yeah. your question. No, I, I think that's really, the, the notion of, of process and product, I think, is a really important um, dynamic to keep in mind with, with this whole conversation. And I, Aisha, I think that comes up a little bit in your work, too, in terms of, you talked at the beginning about, you know, you're giving this wonderful platform and support for these artists, but there's also a leadership skills mm -hmm. component mm -hmm. that, you're not just you know, providing funding and you know, networking opportunities, you're also actively investing in their process mm -hmm. that then I'm sure is transformational for them as, as the artists mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. Of course it's transformational for the you know, participants and the communities who get to be a part of these things. But um, yeah, can you talk a little bit about that, about the, the leadership aspect and, and how some of the artists who have come through the program have, um, how it's informed the stuff they've done thereafter? Yeah, um, so, um, I can touch on one thing in particular which might raise that. Uh, in the training program that we do for the artists, uh, it's based on a, a particular pedagogy that we've developed over the past uh, 15 years. Um, it's a six month training program where folks go in and they learn different skills, um, which we feel like is a good combination of things to go in and do this particular work. So they learn how to um, enter, exit, enter, build, enter, build, and exit communities uh, ethically and responsibly. Um, they learn how t uh, oral history uh, practices, oral historical practices. Um, they learn how to navigate through the public policy system here in New York City, um, a number of different things and tools that they gain access while they're um, within the program with us. But in particular, the entering and exiting um, and building model, um, where artists might go in and have a particular idea in mind. I, I have 
this way that I'm going to change the world and go in with a particular set, like this is what it's going to look like. Um, and there have been a number of stories, it never fails, where an artist will go in with one idea and leave out with something completely different that looked nothing like what they entered with. Um, and they will always say that it's a very particular transformative moment for them when they go in and actually present the idea, the community's not having it at all. They're like, I don't know what you're talking about, I don't understand it, it's not relevant to me in any way whatsoever. Um, and the artists are needing to step back for a moment and practice deep listening. Um, so going around and actually doing the work of listening and connecting with neighbors and just sitting quietly and passively and watching and understanding the rhythms of the community to then go out and then ask themselves, how can I be helpful within this space as opposed to how can I lead, how can I actually help and build together with you? Um, and so I think that's a particularly pointed way of leadership development and understanding you, where you can help build support um, in order to really move and drive change um, and move and drive people together collectively. So it's always never fail, um, will always be the, the, at the end of the exit interview, the artist will always come back and say, yeah, I learned that in particular more than anything else. Cool. Um, John, can you, I mean, I think that's an interesting segue to start thinking about, you know, education more generally and um, the, the use of some of these skills and tools that we're all talking about in different ways um, in the pursuit of telling specific stories that might advance different kinds of practice, whether it's healthcare or, in, or environmental advocacy or urban design and architecture. Um, yeah, say a little bit more about, about what kinds of stories your students are telling in, in terms of environmental, uh, multimedia environmental storytelling, is that the yeah. right name? Yeah, 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 they get, they get, again, they get to choose uh, the s subject matter, but they have, they need to be environmental stories and they need, they get to choose the medium. Um, you know, they're just starting to finalize what they're doing, but it ranges from uh, one student is making a giant mural uh, based on, a, on an artist here in, in New York City that he quite admires, a guy named Al Alexis Rockman, who I happen to know. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to hook him up. So he, he's doing the mural, he's doing storyboards, and he's going to interview uh, Alex at, for a little podcast. And so the interesting thing is when I designed the course, I, I was thinking multimedia just in terms of you could choose a media. Right. I didn't really think about it, the fact that you could use multiple medias <laughs> to tell each story, and then they're, that's kind of the way they're, they're, they're leaning. Um, we have a great maritime museum there on the Hudson River in, in uh, Kingston, and they've collected oral histories over the years of the last fishermen, because you know, commercial fishing is, is not allowed on the Hudson River because of the PCB pollution and, 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 and overfishing. So the last fishermen were, were kind of in the 1980s, uh, and, they, and so they did a pretty good job of, of doing these oral histories, and some, a couple of the students are digging into those, which is actually one of my pet projects. I'm going to kind of use them to, to kind of catapult us into telling uh, uh, um, uh, interesting stories from, from the past. Um, but, and, so, and then um, I have a pretty good Rolodex, so I'm able to bring in people to, like this, you know, to, to talk about their perspective on, on mostly on the, on the, well, on both, on the subject matter side, the media side. I've got a friend up there who does uh, 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 nonfiction theater, mm -hmm. and he, he relies a lot on interviews and oral histories to create theatrical pieces. Um, so it's it's such a wide range. No, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a show at the end, and cool. it'll be quite fun. I do I do a radio show which you mentioned. I'm gonna have them come in and do the takeovers of the radio show in which they have to interview people, which you know is a whole different skill. It's like asking someone who doesn't write to write, mm -hmm. and asking someone to interview somebody who doesn't interview. So I think that that that's gonna be fun. Yes, interviewing is an art form in and of itself. But <laughs> wish I had time to teach a class just on that. But I mean, in, in terms of multi, multimedia and multiple media, you, you said, John, that you're, you know, it's all storytelling and it almost, um, uh, you could tell it in any medium, but I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on how the story changes when you have a, you know, these are some incredibly beautiful images that you shared with us. Um, what does the visual do to a story? What is it, what is it, how does it change when you're doing an interview-based radio format? Have you have any sort of further reflection on how the medium uh, affects or influences the message? Well, I, I couldn't stand up here and do a, a talk without <laughs> visuals. I, I, I would fail. Um, no, I, and I, well, I, I don't and know. And you started I, out with the written word. Yeah, I, I started out as a print, what print journalist, but I, I, I mean, I'll, I'm going to veer away a little bit from your question and address something slightly different, is that I l really enjoy traveling with, because a lot of my work has been you know, on the road, I really enjoy traveling with a photographer, mm -hmm. traveling with a video 
videographer, um, because they see the story in, in a different way than I do. And oftentimes, especially a, a good photographer has his or her own way of kind of focusing on, on a subject matter. And I get to stand to the side and kind of observe and, and pick up things from what the photographer's getting out of them that I might not. I'm, I'm a big believer in small teams like that. Collaboration. Get, collaboration and, and just being able to tell a bigger, deeper, richer story. And not just on the technical side, but on the repertorial side as right. well. Aisha, in terms of like genre and format and medium, um, you know, you started out your career in visual art with mm -hmm. art on the wall, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it seemed like the majority of the artist projects that LP is um, supporting and putting out there in the world necessarily has a somewhat of a performance or an interactive or some kind of like public presence, yeah. installation-based practice. Could you speak a little bit about is that? Is that, a ne is that necessary for it to be community-based, change-oriented work, for it to be ephemeral, performative installation, or... I, I just talk a little bit about, about format and medium in, in terms of your own evolution of your career in the arts as well as the LP. Yeah, and it's actually interesting, Nelly, what you said about uh, the product. And, and for us, it's, all, it's always interesting because we don't always have a product. Um, uh, I guess if the building of people and connecting of people, if that's a product, then that's what it would be. But it's the physical, um, which is something that we always struggle with a lot. People are like, well, what do you do? And you have to actually physically explain what it is that we do because if you don't encounter it in that moment, then you never will actually have that experience because so much of it is around building community um, as the outcome. Put uh, from what we do, but for me, uh, yes, 2D, 3D, interactive installation, all of the different ways um, a story can be told. Um, I think that given what the story is, um, I guess I'm always really curious to see how an artist executes on the telling of that story through the particular medium that they use. Um, so I guess some things are better told and explained and experienced as a flat 2D thing, um, as opposed to a more physical uh, space, as opposed to an ephemeral space. Um, I think that's kind of touching on your question, but I know one thing that we're particularly interested in and we've started to explore was this idea of podcasts um, as long form ways of telling the stories of what we do. It's always really hard to pop up up like a three minute video on the screen and have that encapsulate everything and all the work um, that was required to do a project. So even thinking about Rose Project uh, uh, with the living room on Roosevelt, um, you know, you can see it in a very short, uh, succinct way in this three minute clip, not understanding that it took eight or nine months in act in, in, in to actually pull that together. And so for us, we're really interested in digging in and helping to understand the real process and the real sweat equity and work that's put into creating um, this project. So I'm interested in the multi ways that you can tell a story. So whether or not Rose's story is told in just this way and coupled with a podcast, coupled with some visuals that, in, uh, that encapsulate the project overall, I think there are many different ways in how they're all collaged together, I think tells the bigger, more broad story. Cool. You know, I, I've got a question for you. Yeah, please. Um, and please think of your own questions. I'm about to pass out the mic. Uh, given the changes in technology in the last couple decades, I mean, are there, are there too many stories out there? Are there more than we can possibly consume? And, and how much, is there a point of too much? I, I, I don't know. Never. Never? Yeah. yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think there, there's too many of a lot of things, but I don't think stories is one of them. There might be too many screens, there might be too many um, images, <laughs> but I think story as a sort of overarching concept that, that um, connects people and is what the world is made yeah, I just of. Get, I just get overwhelmed yeah. sometimes yeah, yeah, yeah. with, uh, with, no, I with think, not just stories, but information. I, well, yeah, yeah, I think there is definitely absolutely an oversaturation yeah. to the point where, you know, something that I engage with a lot in, in, in with my students' notions and ever-changing notions of truth, you know, because I'm dealing specifically with traditions of documentary, and you know, that's not the same as objective, <laughs> of course, which you know doesn't really exist. But but even within the the various tropes and genres of nonfiction creative work, whether it's in writing or filmmaking or in other kinds of visual art practice, um, the relationship between you know, scripted and unscripted, uh, documentary and fiction is, um, is ever blurring, but always brings up really important questions, especially now when it's very hard to know what is 
real and true and fake. <laughs> um, so I think stories actually can be marshaled with integrity and ethics uh, in support of um, having a common view of values and ethics and truth. Uh, but that's very different from an oversaturation point where you don't even know what's real or not. Yeah. And so it's a very tricky balance, Well, in, in, in 19, I can reflect just on one 10 year period. In 1999, we went to the middle of the Aleutian Islands. Aleutian Islands are like a diamond necklace that hangs between the Russia and Alaska. And we went to the heart of the Aleutian Islands and this was kind of at the, there was internet, but it was not very sophisticated. Yeah. And the only thing we were able to, I had a satellite telephone so I could call in a, 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 a verbal dispatch and leave it on, the, on an answering machine on the corner of somebody's desk, mm -hmm. which they then had to transcribe and type and put on the machine. We couldn't send pictures, we couldn't yeah. send video, yeah. nothing like that. Okay. And 10 years later, we were in Antarctica, we were south of the <coughs> Antarctic Circle, which was quite far away, and we had a little uh, began satellite uh, about the size of a laptop, so we were able to send video, stills, text, everything. <coughs> that was just in 10 years. Yeah. But my initial experience in Antarctica in 1989 <clears throat> I traveled with a Frenchman, and he used to say all the time that he wished he'd lived in a in a in a world before there were maps. You know, and and so it made me think that sometimes I wish that this insta sharing yeah. wasn't always so insta, because now it, the, 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 it's just it's just too much out there. You know, and how relevant? Some of it, I mean, some of it's less relevant. Well, one thing that people have talked about that I think is an important thing to support is the notion of the story as kind of a foil to the algorithm, <laughs> um, which is sort of really trying to activate the agency and authorship and individuality of the ways in which you select details and string them together with a context um, as distinct from something that is, uh, you know, machine learned and then imposed back upon you in terms of, you know, recommending songs or advertisements, but also it goes a lot deeper and darker once you probe a little yeah. bit. I'm just curious to that point. I, I say never enough stories because I think of people who haven't been given access to tell stories or stories that we don't know of. Um, so I say never because there are so many stories that, that need to be told that have not been given the opportunity or the ability to be told. But, but the more crowded it is, the harder it is to hear them sometimes. I guess that's my, yeah, only, yeah. my only concern. Yeah. Which brings up the role of institutions. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're not a a free-for-all for, for interactive community-based <laughs> arts where it's all one big repository. Um, there's a very specific institutional lens that you bring to the selection and the training and the leadership stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think the other way to, to think about it is also the, the point Nelly brings up of, of process versus product. Mm -hmm. um, there might be too many, you know, it, I think it's conceivable that there are too many finished, polished, top-down mm -hmm. <laughs> stories out there already, but um, there has not been an equitable distribution of the tools. Mm -hmm. So I think thinking about that in different sectors where we don't normally think about, where I mean, a sector where, I mean, I think there was like a little bit of a gasp in the room when you said creativity is a dirty word <laughs> in medicine. Everyone's like, what? <laughs> creativity but, is a Nelly, <laughs> Nelly do, do, do some of these, are you working only with doctors in training or no? No. Do, and, no. no? And, and does, do they sometimes balk when you ask them to write and, sh oh, um, and share? Almost always. Almost yeah. always, yeah. yeah. And how what, what tricks? How do you how do you well, force them? It I mean, it totally depends on the context. But if you're in context where we're working with, you know, in hospitals or in where where the clinicians are in practice, it's unfortunate because technic usually the people who need the work the least are the ones that come, and the ones that need the work the most, you know find that they are busy that hour. Um, so in my yeah. experience... Spi spinal surgery interrupts, yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, there have only been a couple times where it has been, where that's been really an issue and has been disruptive. But even in those moments, the, one, the, the people who are so resistant to it, if they, if they allow themselves to go through the process of doing it, um, they, you know, at the end of the hour, they're cheerleaders, um, it, inevitably, but it's just getting them to, to actually do the thing that they're so like, oh, what is this for? Why are we being made to do this? Um, it's hard, it's really hard. Um, especially when you're not in that world of power, when you don't have an MD, it's even more hard. Um, so I was connected to a program at Harvard um, called Risk and Prevention in the School of Education, 
and some of my background was in media, and so I was able to do this cool kind of research project on uh, Children's Hospital in Boston, and this doctor used to be a filmmaker, and so he brought, you know, he was wedding the two of medicine and film, and again, I apologize if, if, I, if you already um, talked about this, but I hear that you're talking about from the doctor's perspective, having the doctors write, etc. cetera. Um, this program was actually giving them video cameras, and now, of course, you can use phones and everything, but to document their, for instance, their day-to-dayness in, with diabetes or day-to-dayness with whatever it was. And then it was um, coded, et cetera, and used uh, most, I, I don't know if it was quantitative and qualitative, for sure qualitative, um, to guide the doctors in a different kind of way working with patients because they were really seeing that day-to-dayness of, of, a, of a client, a patient, a human being um, wrestling with something uh, related to their health. So I'm wondering um, if you can address that or maybe you're already doing that, I'm not sure. So they, they were seeing footage of patients in their day-to-day, is that, is that my, am I hearing so that the, right? So the, the patients were trained to use these cameras and they would take them home with them and really in their own narrative and experience in a very detailed manner, talk about you know what what they're experiencing day to day with their um, health challenge, and then it was brought back to be coded, etc., and and used as an educational uh, and t- just in general tool for the doctors to help them come at it from a human perspective and seeing nuanced experiences yeah. that they might not have seen otherwise. Um, that sounds great, and there, I know there is a lot of work being done similar to that. Um, like I can think of some couple photographers that I worked with who were doing similar projects, um, and there and there is a lot of work being done on the patient side for sure as well in terms of um, getting patients to write about their experiences and what that is doing. You know, there's a lot a lot of studies also done about what writing does for our health and usually the, the when there is outcome when there are outcomes to be shared it's often you know patients actual health numbers change when they're writing um, so yes there, that work is being done we we don't I can't say that we have done work quite like that um, as I said we usually we tend to f- we tend to work with the practitioners um, and less with the patients. In part, that's just because the world of medicine is so complicated and it's a lot, it's just to get anything done is like really incredibly hard. So it tends to be easier to get a room of clinicians together than you know doing a project like that, I imagine would really take a long time and a lot of effort to coordinate. Not that that's a reason not to do it, but um, anyway. But I think what that brings up is notions of um, participation, uh, which is definitely something that you know documentary filmmaking has been sort of contending with, with some good results and some strange results uh, in terms of, of really trying to not only provide more information, but also um, uh, deal with that power dynamic that happens in all kinds of contexts between professionals and non-professionals, whether it's doctors and patients or designers and community members. So this is a question for Aisha. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, you talked about the laundromat project being hyper-local with a national um, awareness or national view, but um, a lot of your projects, or I don't know if all of them are based just in the boroughs, largely mm-hmm. in this area, mm-hmm. but do you have any advice for like, maybe how to take this community building to smaller towns and maybe different um, states, different places? <laughs> Uh, that's a good question. Um, I can I can share with you how we think about that um, in the form of ripple effects. Um, so where um, our projects are hyperlocal because we are in New York City dealing with specific New York City issues, um, people travel, people move, people share information. 
um, uh, information is accessible beyond just where the project took place. So I think at the core, our pedagogy is something that's translatable um, to other places with adding some specificity based on the location where it's at. The issues might be different. Um, uh, gentrification here in New York City might look very different uh, in New Orleans than it does in Los Angeles and, and, and other things of that nature. Um, but I think with us, the core of um, uh, particularly the training, so understanding how you do deep listening within community, how you understand entering, exiting, and entering, building, and exiting a community, um, understanding how you uh, conduct oral histories with uh, individuals is something that is not um, neighborhood focused. It is a particular practice and way of working within a neighborhood that can be taken and um, brought to other locations and areas. So, how do I go into my community in Los Angeles and? connect with local um, organizations or local individuals who are driving movements and listen to what they're saying and then help to move that through. I think it's something that's translatable throughout beyond New York City. And also in all the projects that you shared, not only were they hyper-local in the neighborhoods they were dealing with in New York City, but there was always a community partner. There's right? always a community partner. So that seems like a framework that is translatable. I mean, obviously not every city or town or place has the same you know, rich diversity of institutions that New York has, but there's there are always advocates yeah. everywhere. Yeah, and then community partner is 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 broad also because it can be a particular organization, but it can be uh, you know a, a circle of, uh, you know, for lack of a better but for simplicity's sake, uh, a women's book club group can actually be a community-based organization. Um, a group of local residents who actually have a connectedness and embeddedness and a sense of knowledge about a neighborhood itself can be thought of as a community partner or a community uh, connectedness. I guess organization makes it a little bit squishy to say that, but yeah. Uh, I have two questions. One is for Nelly, the other one is for Ayesha. Um, how, it was related a little bit to that one, but since we are in the studio that interacts with the regional scale and in rural areas, how can we uh, implement some of these uh, in interventions in the space in such a scale, like a rural environment? And then the other one is, since many health issues stem from uh, man-made environmental uh, impacts, how uh, do you incorporate this into your narrative in order to generate a a speech of hope between the patient and the, and the health caregiver? Um, I love that question so much, but I don't know that I have an answer for it. Um, I like, just want to cry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just love the way you, the way you wrote that question. Um, no, I don't know. I mean, God, yes. I mean, I was thinking about when Kasim gave his introduction about the, I don't remember how you, I think I wrote it down, but I don't remember how you said it about the way that, oh yeah, you said just that you're always thinking about the way that the social experience of place and the physical experience, and I was thinking about that. I mean, hospitals are, are not unanimously, but quite frequently terrible, terrible places to be, and just that idea of like how to, you know, just in a physical way, how do we make the space be a more hopeful place for people to be, you know, you're in that, space, you can't wear your own clothes, you can't have your own, you know, I mean, on and on and on, all the reasons why it's not pleasant, but um, anyway, that idea that our illnesses are man-made and then how do we create a hopeful dialogue, I don't know, I don't have an answer. I mean, I can't say that we're pressing very hard on that particular issue in, in our particular program, um, but your question makes me want to think more about how to do it. And certainly the role of, of systems and infrastructures runs through all of your work in certain ways in terms of dealing with the, the, the power of the individual in the face of extraordinarily complex circumstances, whether it's environmental risks or, um, or environmental damage or environmental justice. Yeah, I mean, maybe one hopeful, one hopeful way to look at it is like that's actually what we are trying to do with the work itself. I mean, we get the clinicians who come to us, you know, we do these periodic weekend workshops throughout the year where clinicians come from all over the world and the ones who come tend to be really burnt, really burned out and really just like, I can't take it anymore, you know, I need some help and they come to us for, 
for healing and for hope and to be in a room of other people who also feel that way and are, who, are gonna, who are willing to share and willing. And they do feel, I mean, I can say that for sure, by the end of the weekend, by the end of three days of sitting and reading and writing together, they do feel hope, more hope than they did, than they did coming in. Um, whether that lasts, I don't know. Um, but I think that sense of, you know, if there's hope to be found, it is in community and in the, the work itself. Do you want to say anything about the regional scale or rural contexts, or? Yeah, and it's, it's the question, how, it, the replicability of it within regional areas. Um, I, I think I just uh, lean into, or we lean into, just going back to our tagline, uh, making art, build community, and creating change. So thinking about creativity um, as a, an infinite resource. So for us, we believe everybody has access to creativity. Everybody can be a creative individual. And thinking about and putting it and positioning it within a context that if you drive uh, the use of creativity to create change, to spark conversations, to drive issues. Um, that's something that can happen. It doesn't have to be New York City, it can be rural, but leaning into creativity as that, that tool, that key tool, um, to actually build uh, these structures or these systems around that and the ability to tap into an imaginative sense in nature um, of seeing things, uh, valuing creativity as a resource that we don't always think of. Um, automatically when we think about how we create change within within our particular areas. Um, so just a question for everyone. Uh, you guys have talked a lot about m making stories and also making space for other people to tell their stories and you guys have <coughs> spoken about some of the research you, research you do before you get ready for preparing your narrative or opening yourself up to receiving narratives. Um, at what point do you feel, or what sort of thresholds do you look for in your research to say, okay, now I'm ready to um, work on building my narrative or opening myself up to welcoming narratives? Well, you mean that you can, it's almost like you can never do too much research in advance. Um, you know, I, it makes me think of uh, the and kind of a non-multimedia response, but that is just a response to, to writing specifically is that, you know, any, anyone that I ever meet who tells me that they like writing, I don't believe. <laughs> I think they're lying. Because writing, if you do it seriously and do it well, it's not fun. My, my favorite quote is attributed to Anonymous, and it, it's, you know, I love having written. Uh, also, you know, while on one hand I say you can never do too much research, uh, you know, outlining is not writing, thinking about writing is not writing, talking about writing is not writing, you know, writing is writing. Uh, and which I then guess could be extrapolated to all mediums is that, you know, while the research in advance is super important, you know, the focus on the end product um, is, is even more important. And, the beauty of, uh, of collaboration is, uh, from my perspective, whether it's an editor working on a print piece or editors working on a video piece, is, is that I, I like that collaboration, you know, especially if you're working with people you, you trust. So um, that was a really bad way of answering your question, but. Uh, do you have anything to add to that? When you know you can share. We're storytellers in a different way. Um, I think we hold space for the telling of stories and we provide resources and, and uh, opportunities, uh, gate openers, gatekeepers, however you might wanna uh, label it, uh, for folks to tell their stories. So for us, it's a very collaborative process um, and it's also leaning into that area of ethics and accountability um, and making sure we're telling the story in the way that uh, feels just to the person whose story it is that we're sharing. Um, so we hold individuals' stories um, as opposed to me, Aisha, creating a story that I'm then sharing out as a, I think a very different thing right. than and, telling And when I, watch, when I watch your video clips, it makes me want to tell stories about your storytellers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also, I was really taken with something you said at the very end about um, you recognize that archives are always changing, which I think is a really hard thing to do mm -hmm. because you know the record you have is the record you have, and of course it's it's riddled with exclusions and uh, it, you know hasn't been distributed or inclusive in all these ways. But 
you're also creating all kinds of new archives because of you know the conversation piece where you're in the living room, the first one. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you do with that? And I was also thinking, Nelly, about the experience at the hospital. Like, there was all this reflective writing sitting there without any sort of uh, place to operationalize that that archive. Um, yeah, but I think that also relates to it, is that there's the, the research you do in advance of producing a narrative, but then also you need to continually reflect mm -hmm. on the material and the resources and the assets mm -hmm. um, that have gotten you to that place, because that's, that's, not, that's not solid ground either. Thank you so much for this really interesting set of different forms of storytelling. So my question is just, I'm in the narrative medicine program, um, and I'm curious how these different forms of artistic and creative practice are informing, I guess, kind of high level methods in which you plan like an urban design or how are you pulling from different artistic mediums to inform design and, and vice versa, how do, as a filmmaker, as a novelist, as a visual artist, how are we, or in, in general, pulling from these urban spaces, like, I guess, High level, how is the artistic practice informing design, and then vice versa, how is the design practice informing artistic practice? That's a very <laughs> big question, and a very, and a very interesting and important question. I mean, I think um, you know, design has a very specific and complicated history with, at various moments in time, sort of uh, holding up its creativity in a very narrow definition of formalism, um, of creating objects and placing them in spaces. It, irrespective of their context. Um, and other places in time, uh, design practice being deeply, deeply invested and interested in you know, the societal and contextual fabric in which uh, it's operating. And that is actually not a linear change. It's, it goes up and down various points in time um, where you have, you know, you had a generation of, of architects who wanted to be sculptors and now you have a generation of architects who want to be weavers, you know, broadly speaking and metaphorically so. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's kind of shifting. Uh, there's always a very deep and important role for visual representation, um, it, both in terms of working out one's own process of how one is sort of articulating an intervention in physical space, um, but also uh, something that where storytelling becomes really activated and instrumentalized in urban design practice is the role of um, visual narrative in getting people to come on board with whatever it is that you're proposing. So the role of storytelling in community engagement is very different from the role of storytelling in business development, for example. And design practice uses both <laughs> modes all the time, one to sort of get you know, stakeholders involved and engaged, or to make it seem like they're involved and engaged, um, or to sell its product, uh, because it is sort of, it is as a profession also still a tool of, of capital in very important ways. Uh, but I think an, an, an important other influence that to even add on more to your very large question is um, some of the ways in which knowledge has been produced in the academy that has other tool sets. You know, so I talk a lot about the role of sociology and anthropology in informing ways that I think about different ways to teach people how to do interviews or how to observe a neighborhood intersection, um, a different ways of sort of thinking about writing as a, um, as a process that's an active process of interpretation, not just something that's you know received as a description or an, or an evocation, but actually something that's making sense of what you're seeing. Um, so I think there's lots of constant interfaces uh, between various art forms and design practice. Uh, but I do think that the if one thing that this sort of the fact that this symposium continues to exist um, and grow and evolve is, I think it's safe to say that. The idea of storytelling generally as something that has um, applied value in uh, a variety of professional contexts is on the rise, at least pedagogically. I don't know if it's on the rise in terms of, um, and so, yeah, I mean, we can debate whether if there's a tipping point <laughs> where, where that leads to um, too much, you know, soft and squishy qualitative. Well, I, I, I base this on having just done this as a Google search on how to tell a story. <laughs> And what do you think, what, 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 what are the first 10 things that come up? How, what, why, where, when? No, there, no it's, it's, more, it's about performance pieces. Uh -huh. It's about spoken word pieces. It's the moth influence, moth radio influence. You know, that, that now is what people perceive as t the first thing people think of when they think of 
storytelling, mm -hmm. which is not a bad thing. Yeah. No, and I mean, and we're all always telling not only stories in our work, but telling stories about our work and telling stories about telling stories about our work, which is what we've been doing here. Um, and, you know, and certainly that sense of oral presentation um, and the legacy of expository rhetoric, which I think runs through you know, visual art practice as well as documentary work, um, is still there. I mean, I, even, even when my students are making you know, poetic city symphonies with no text or information, there's still an argument or a question. Um, which is something that you know we've learned from from rhetoric um, that might not be obvious or overt, but is still um, embedded in the way in which we articulate our own positions. Now, um, my question is maybe looking more for an advice, and it's when 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 you approach a community or people and you want to uh, reflect on your story uh, the as much as much as you can the natural behavior of the people how you can do it, because when you just bring a camera in front of the people, their behavior, their natural behavior, just totally, not totally different, but it changed, and probably the way how you want to, to show the message turns into a different way that you don't want to, so. No, that's a really fair question. We, we have a big issue. I, I mentioned the fact that the, the Hudson River is off limits to commercial fishing, and Yet, as a result, if you go up and down the Hudson, you go into any town and go out on any dock, you'll find people fishing. Uh, and even though there are signs at, at virtually every dock that say, you know, do not catch the fish, and now there are signs that say, if you do catch the fish, don't eat this part. Signs, I think, have been translated around New York City into 15 or 16 languages. Because you can still catch fish. It's not that there aren't fish there, but they're, but they're, they're badly, some of them are badly polluted. Anyway, the relevance there is that we've tried to tell that story, but when you approach people who are fishing there, it's, it's kind of forbidden. So they, they, they're the last people that, want, that you know, they, they don't want to talk to you at all. Um, so that, that, in our recent experience, that's been really hard. But in terms of working with people who do cooperate with you, you know, you just you have to be kind of mellow and low key, and you, can't, you have to take your time, and you have to meet them first without cameras, and, you know, there, are, there is a school of thought, and Kasim probably has seen this, where the documentary filmmakers go out and pre-report, you know, go out and do interviews first and then build the, the film and go back and, and get people to kind of repeat themselves or regurgitate them, the, themselves, um, which is a way of kind of uh, in, endearing them to you. But yeah, you have to be very, very cautious. And, and just showing up with a camera in your hand and, and saying, tell me your story is awkward. And, and, and doesn't work very often. Yeah. Entering, building, and exiting. Entering, building, and exiting. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I think also transparency around how their story is going to be shared and told um, is something that we always try to be intentional around. So um, as much as possible as we can, letting folks know who it's being shared with, on what platforms it's being shared, so that they feel they have some control over uh, what they're sharing and telling. Um, my question is for Nelly. You were speaking about how the whole um, project that you do revolves around healing and hope, and that the patients that you're dealing with are generally isolated. We're looking at the federal courts around the Hudson Valley, and I think people would be more reluctant to take these people out of isolation and incorporate them back into society. And we were actually looking at film and media as a tool to fix that. So if you have any advice on how we could go about this and how we could talk to people and make the community more enthusiastic about welcoming these people and listening to their stories and empathize, um, empathizing with it, that actually would be really great. I'm, uh, I don't, <laughs> but I'm thinking of people I might be able to ask and put you in touch with who, you know, who know more. I, I, lo I, lo I just love that I even get asked that question. Um, you know, I, the work that I do has brought me into a world that I really am not a part of. I mean, I, I'm a part of it now only in my, but it's kind of amazing to me always that, that I well, have a mask of authority. In I think way. you kind of answered, <laughs> you, you, I think you answered this question a little bit before and maybe we could just end on this okay. because I think it's, um, it's something that actually also cuts across all of your work. Um, I mean, I think actually you used the word storytelling circles, but you talked about the sort of the context, you know, when people come to the group. And I think really in terms of building the kinds of, you know, smaller subsets of, of communal relationships that 
will create a certain safe space um, yeah, in which people are good. able to share is is a is a active practical tool. It's not just determined by external factors like the size of the room. You know, it's something that you actually can really design as an experience. So I wonder if you could just share a little bit about the like. Are you sitting in a circle? <laughs> like, thank you. you. Know. Okay, <laughs> now, now I can answer the question. Um, <coughs> yes, we always sit in a circle. Um, very much try and make the space and the feeling in the room as democratic as that's ever possible. Um, and I mean, I I can only speak to how I do the work, um, but. Um, you know, and I come into the room with a lot of anxiety as I'm making clear to you. Like, I'm, I'm not an MD, and when you're sitting in a room of MDs and trying to make them listen to you, it's very intimidating, um, having been a patient, you know, I mean, for, all, for many reasons. So I bring a piece of writing, but I, I kind of have to claim my own expertise in this one area that I am bringing something to the room that I know about and um, that that's worth something. You just have to sort of embody that despite your own anxiety. Um, and then we read together and I really just try and ask open-ended questions um, as much as I can model that there's absolutely no judgment in the room, um, whatever anyone said. I mean, the tricky part, this is not necessarily relevant for you, but when we're the one thing that happens that is a little tricky is people inevitably veer off talking about the poem, say, and start t debating or, t or sharing, either sharing something very sensitive about their own life, which is hard to hear for obvious reasons, or debating something that they feel very strongly. But anyway, it can get contentious, and that, for me, and I don't know what context you would be using, but for me, the, the way out of that is always to just to sort of gently call us back to the material that we're looking at together um, so that it doesn't become, you know, too emotional or, or sort of where I'm being asked to be in a role that I'm not comfortable in. Um, and then same with the writing. When I ask them to write, I say ahead of time, you know, basic set of rules like, we're, I'm going to ask you to share what you write. If it's okay, if you write, you end up writing something you don't want to share, you don't have to. That's okay. But I want to encourage you to write something you feel comfortable sharing, um, so that they know ahead of time. They won't. They're not getting any surprises. Um, and then uh, I also say I, I want to encourage everyone to respond to what they hear, so that I'm not the only person responding. But I, I often am anyway. Um, but that sense of sort of slowly building a, a environment in the room where people feel safe and comfortable as much as that's possible because they're doing something they're not used to doing which makes them uncomfortable. So um, as much as you can sort of model an attitude of um, that they're being held um, in some way is really important. I don't know. If and I think, no, I think it's super helpful and also in an interesting way kind of could be considered a um, an analogy for, for one definition of design practice, which is what everyone here is dealing with, which is to say, really respect an open-ended inquiry that might lead you in a direction that you weren't intending, but within a context that has guidelines that respect both your own expertise and your willingness to have that expertise be challenged um, in a trusting and sharing environment. And I think that's um, something that we should aspire for our stories to be, as well as the way we teach it and empower others to tell our own stories. Um, and to really sort of foreground that in the way in which we, I'm just going to keep coming back to Asia, this entering, building, and exiting community, because I think it's a really important framework to keep Urban in mind. Bush whether you're, um, sorry, what? Urban Bush women. Uh -huh. okay. Excellent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because I think it's a really important framework to think about um, not just ethics, which is where it comes in from, but also the, the contextual and experience design. Um, that goes into the context in which we both encourage people to share stories and then record those and, and, and push them out, whether it's in an advocacy context, in a you know environmental conservation context, uh, whether it's in healthcare or in community change through art. So can we please join me in thanking our esteemed storytellers?